There's a new book out about Jimmy Page, but it's a novel. It's called Searching for Jimmy Page, and it's the first literary novel that features Zeppelin. It was put out by Livingston Press, University of West Alabama, and the author is Christy Halberg. One critic said that Searching for Jimmy Page focuses on a daughter's journey to grasp the essence of family relationships through cultural icons and musical references. So she's trying to find her family through rock and roll music. Well, if you wrote a book about my radio show, send it my way at Alice at Nights with AliceCooper.com. I'll be back with more of your favorite music and me, your nightmare of a night man. I still get such a thrill every time I hear that Alice Cooper promo of my novel when it first came out. So thank you, Dana Frank, for introducing me to Catherine Turman, who used to produce Alice's radio show, Nights with Alice Cooper, and made that promo happen. And then I need to back up and thank Carrie Robinson, who hosted my book launch at New York City's KGB Red Room. And that was such an amazing experience. And she introduced me to Dana Frank. Thanks to Joe Taylor at Livingston Press for publishing the thing in the first place. Now the book has gone on and won a whole bunch of awards. And I've had the chance to talk to some incredible Led Zeppelin insiders and journalists like Chris Charlesworth, Stuart Epps, and Danny Goldberg. Congratulations on your novel and rock and roll. I get to talk to the legendary Dave Lewis, who is the founder and editor of the Led Zeppelin fan magazine, Tight But Loose, for the first time on this episode. Well, congratulations with your book, um, which has had an amazing reaction, and I'm sure you must be very pleased. And finally, the audiobook of Searching for Jimmy Page is out. This episode is a celebration of the audiobook release. Props to the talking book here in Asheville, North Carolina, for producing the audiobook and to Melissa Connell, who did such a wonderful job narrating it. At the end of the day, my goal is always to just make the author happy. This is the book Searching for Jimmy Page. Searching for Jimmy Page. Searching for Jimmy Page. Of course, there's your own Searching for Jimmy Page. Warning, you can't talk about your own book on your podcast. I got no problem breaking the rules. This is a rock and roll show. Rock is Lit! Welcome to Season 2 of Rock is Lit, the first and still only podcast devoted to rock novels, brought to you by Pantheon Podcast Network. Make sure you subscribe so you won't miss any of the episodes featuring some amazing rock novelists and music experts. I'm your host, Christy Alexander Hallberg, author of my own rock novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, from Livingston Press. Find me on Facebook at Christy Alexander Hallberg, and Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Christy Hallberg. Visit my website at ChristyAlexanderHallberg.com. If you enjoy the show, do me a solid and pop on over to Good Pods or Apple Podcasts and leave a comment and rating. As always, Wyatt, the Rock is Lit mascot, and I thank you for tuning in. I'm so excited about this episode celebrating the release of the audiobook of my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page. Melissa Connell, who narrated the audiobook, is here, and later, the amazing Dave Lewis, who is a Led Zeppelin expert, super fan, founder and editor of the Led Zeppelin fan magazine, Tight But Loose, and guru to all us diehard Zepp heads, shares his memories of the band and the magazine that has chronicled their music and honored their legacy since 1978. But first, here's a little background and context about Searching for Jimmy Page. The novel was published in paperback, hardback, and Kindle by Livingston Press on October 20, 2021. And you can still get the Kindle version on Amazon. And the paperback is available at your local indie bookstore, Amazon, and pretty much wherever you buy books. Now that the audiobook is out on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, I feel like this journey I've been on with my book baby is complete. Okay, well, I'm still waiting for Cameron Crowe or some hungry young director to call about adapting the novel into a movie. Hey, a girl can dream. Anyway, let's get on with the celebration of the audiobook. For those of you who aren't familiar with Searching for Jimmy Page, it's a story that follows 18-year-old protagonist Luna Kane 
from her family's farm in eastern North Carolina all the way to England to search for Led Zeppelin's enigmatic guitarist, Jimmy Page, whom her free-spirited deceased mother, Claudia, hinted may be Luna's father. Now that's the plot, but the novel is really about mother-daughter relationships, dealing with grief, and how characters, especially Luna and her mother, Claudia, use art, music, myth, and lore to create their own personal narratives. Like the writer Martha Southgate said in her blurb for my book, quote, you don't have to love Led Zeppelin to have a whole lot of love for Christy Alexander Hallberg's gorgeous rock and roll fantasy. Searching for Jimmy Page will speak to anyone who has ever loved, truly loved, someone they know only from the posters on their walls and the music that speaks to their very soul, end quote. By the way, you can go to my website, christyalexanderhallberg.com, to read more blurbs from folks like Pamela Day Barr and check out the awards the novel has won. Back to Martha Southgate's quote, I agree that the story is about much more than just music or Led Zeppelin or Jimmy Page, but they're all three the heart, maybe even the soul of the novel. And that band, especially Jimmy Page, has been a major part of my life since I was 15 years old. Because of that, And because Rock is Lit is a podcast devoted to the role music plays in fiction, I'm going to focus more on the Led Zeppelin-related aspect of the novel in this episode. When I share excerpts from the audiobook with people, I tend to play the first chapter because it sets the story in motion. You get a sense of the tone and the nature of the story, and you get a hint of how important Jimmy Page and the Led Zeppelin song Four Sticks is going to be to the main character, Luna. So I'm going to share that with you on this episode. Here's Melissa Connell reading Chapter 1 of Searching for Jimmy Page. Part 1. Four Sticks. Chapter 1 The night my great-grandfather died, frigid air howled through the pines and swirled down the chimney of his shack near our fallow tobacco fields in eastern North Carolina. My grandmother and I kept vigil at his bedside, a battery-operated space heater oscillating at our feet, kerosene lamps lofting shadows on the walls. He'd refused to install electricity and insisted the fireplace remain unlit at night. He claimed spirits talked to him through the flu at the witching hour. So did birds, especially owls. He said they were good omens, unless they flew inside your house. Owl in the house means death's coming, he'd say. I lulled my head against the wall, bare like all the others. No family portraits or prosaic artwork or thumbtacked greeting cards with snapshots of my great-grandfather's progeny tucked inside. The shack was cluttered with clothes and other debris from a fading life, but the walls were naked. He preferred it that way, no memories or illusions, except the ones that came to him at night. At the stroke of twelve, he wrapped his knotty fingers around my wrist and squeezed. Can you hear it? he asked his voice like winter wind crackling through kindling. An icy shiver ran through me. He had not spoken since that balmy summer night when I was nine years old, when the river ran dry and the pines began to cry. The night my mother committed suicide. An abomination, he'd call it. A sin against providence. He'd sat expressionless in his rocking chair while Grandma delivered the news. His face bathed in candlelight, then hobbled into the woods and chanted my mother's name, like an incantation, a prayer for deliverance. Then he'd spoken no more. I inched closer to him, close enough to smell the implacable stench of the dying. Hear what? I asked timorously. Owls, he said, like music. My body fluttered as if it were falling out of oblivion, slowly, unwittingly, the air prickly and thin. Long ago, I'd heard a song about owls crying in the night. The singers wail primeval, in sync with marauding guitar licks, the beat like jungle drums. 
I felt them vibrating inside me just then, like a distant echo from another life, one that still included my mother. Can you hear the music? He persisted, struggling to raise his head. Grandma implored me with her eyes. I, I can hear it, Granddaddy. He gave a shuddering laugh. <laughs> Ain't in your head, girl. Where then? I waited, watching his chest rise and fall, his fitful breaths grow shallow. The caesura between life and death. It's in your soul, he finally said. He nudged his Bible beside him, giving voice to verse. Ecclesiastes 6.10 That which hath been is named already. He dropped my arm and exhaled, his face pallid and drawn. Grandma and I stood over him, bearing witness, sleep pelting the windows. That song about the owls, its searing guitar haunting me, like fragments of memory I'd buried with my childhood. Grainy images of my mother in her yellow bedroom with her lavender incense and votive candles. Her black and white photograph of a rock star standing on a stage at Kizar Stadium in 1973. Dressed all in white, lips pursed, unruly dark hair framing a beautific face. Guitar strapped over his shoulder, arms spread wide, as if he were awaiting crucifixion. The two of them were intertwined in my mind's eye, like ashes wafting in a summer wind, waiting for water to receive them. I was born of water and moonlight, and of her and of him. Grandma stopped the clock on the mantel to mark the moment of my great-grandfather's passing, as if halting time held power, then, forever, now. She handed me a flashlight, then draped her overcoat around me, the scent of Jurgen's lotion and talcum powder lingering in the fabric. Go on home, honey, she said. I, I shouldn't have brought you here. You didn't, I said faintly. I'd followed her from our farmhouse at dusk, trudged the quarter mile past the barn and hog pen, through the woods, where the footpath ended, as if I'd heard my great-grandfather's keening call. Go home. Grandma said, prodding me toward the door. I'll be along directly. I wrenched away from her and stared at my great-grandfather, the withered shell that remained, searching for some part of him that still looked vital, the outline of his body beneath the quilt, legs splayed as if the cat he used to own were nestled between them, his arm dangling over the side of the bed. Grandma tucked it underneath the quilt her mother had made tattered and yellowed with age, the same quilt that had covered her while she lay dying over a half a century before, cancer ravaging her breast, flies swarming the window screens, attracted by the feeder of rotting flesh, all because her husband had believed he could heal her with ritual and prayer. I harbor a picture of that night in my mind's eye, my great-grandmother's bewildered stare, her mouth a perfect O, a last word half-spoken, an oracle undelivered. Now he was dead, his jaw unhinged, spittle on his grizzled chin, his only child by his side, the daughter whom he only recognized after she'd tell him her name, the name he'd given her seventy years ago. Do like I say, Grandma said sternly. I stood there breathless, my great-grandfather's milky eyes, fixed and dilated, seeing nothing, seeing everything, boring into mine. Grandma cupped my chin in her hand. Don't look back, she said with urgency in her voice. I never had before, not after my mother died. Like my great-grandfather, I had not spoken her name since. I had not heard her voice in a brooding summer rain or felt her hand clasping mine in a sibylline dream, or seen her face in the shadow of a stealthy hunter's moon. I had erased her and the sainted sinner who conjured music and magic from an electric guitar. His photograph in my mother's bedroom, her unfaithful talisman. I'd never looked back, never. Until that winter's night in February 1988, 
when I was 18 years old. The past summoned like fire in my great-grandfather's shack. Phantom owls crying in the night. It was inevitable. Perhaps it was even providence. Now would return me to then. The tale demanded to be told. This is Melissa Connell, and you're listening to Rock is Lit. I'm excited to welcome Melissa Connell, who narrates the newly released audiobook of my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page. Melissa Connell is an actor whose credits span theater productions, TV commercials, and roles on such shows as Comedy Central's Strangers with Candy, ABC's One Life to Live, and HBO's Sex in the City, and film, including roles in the internationally and nationally award-winning independent film, Bathroom Troll, the short film Control, and AKA, which took home Best Film at the New York Independent Film and Video Festival. She's also a singer, voice actor, private acting coach, and a national award-winning radio documentary producer. Her radio documentary, Tobacco, Filtering Out the Truth, won first place from the Philadelphia Press Organization and the National Headliners Group. Melissa received her BA in Radio TV Film and her MA in Public Relations from Rowan University. Melissa also serves as an actor, writer, client care manager, facilitator, and phone survey specialist for True to Life Training in Central New Jersey. She resides in New Jersey with her two children, along with their crazy Labradoodle. Welcome to Rock is Lit. (laughs) Thank you. It is so great to put a face with the voice that I've been listening to for all these months. Oh, my goodness. I I can only imagine. You must be sick of this voice, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. I mean, how many times did I tell Chris at the Talking Book, you have this this warmth to your voice. It just kind of invites you in. Oh, thank you. I don't know if my children would agree with that. (laughs) (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) Actually, this is the first time we've communicated directly in any capacity. We always got messages to each other through Chris Hartrum, who is the super cool editor of The Talking Book, the audiobook production house that produced the Searching for Jimmy Page audiobook. So this is extra nice to to be able to connect with you now. At what point did you start doing audiobook narration? So I've been doing voiceover for a really long time, I guess about, I don't know, 25 years now or so. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it was actually just last year I was working with an audio engineer, Chris, who I had done work with off and on through his studio through different projects, whether an industrial or a commercial project. And he had said to me, you know, have you ever thought about doing audiobooks? And I said, I have. I just don't really know how to get started. I don't have my own studio. I, I did at one point, And then when I moved, I lost that space. And so I really was sort of like held hostage as to where I could do that kind of work. And he said, let's talk. And the next thing you know, he's hooking me up with the ACX website and telling me all about how to get my samples on there. And we started working together. And it's been awesome because it's so different. Every project is, is unique and, and fulfilling in, in different ways. So it's been really the past year that I've been doing audiobooks. And, and I'm sad I didn't start sooner because I love it. Do you know off the top of your head how many you've done? I think it's about eight now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So about how long does it take you to do each project? So it really depends. It depends on how long the book is, obviously, an hour book versus I'm doing a nursing manual right now, which is very different. It's all very medical and just narration. Not super exciting, but I'm learning a lot, actually. (laughs) And so like that one's only five hours. So For each, it depends on each voiceover artist, and they kind of do it by a ratio. Like, if you're doing all your own editing yourself, your time, it's going to be much longer for the per completed hour. That's kind Mm -hmm. of how they do it, right? So I'm very lucky that I have Chris, who's a professional audio engineer who knows how to do all of that, because I do not. And so him and I have a ratio for every finished hour. 
it probably takes us an hour and a half to do. Okay. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yes. You know, clean things up to take out breaths, to take out mistakes or a mispronunciation and, and kind of tweak it. Yeah. Well, now you're in New Jersey and Talking Book is here in Asheville where I am. How did you get connected with Talking Book? So they had posted on the ACX website, the Searching for Jimmy Page audition. And because I'm a member of ACX, I saw the audition and I read a little excerpt about the book and I thought, oh, this sounds so interesting. I <laughs> love a character driven story. And so I said to Chris, I want to audition for this piece. And he said, okay, great. And so we did that first chapter, I think, mm -hmm. book, and that's what we submitted. And then I heard from Chris at Talking Books. And then he told me, I think we're going to produce this on our own, separate from ACX, but we wanted to see if you wanted to do this. And I said, well, yeah, of course. And so now I'm actually almost halfway through my second book with Talking Books right now, which is a totally different kind of book called Secret Agent Gals. I was thinking you'd been affiliated with Talking Book longer than this, but this was just your first book with them. With them, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Okay, well, let's let's talk about Searching for Jimmy Page then. You know, the first thing I have to ask you is, are you a Led Zeppelin fan? You know, I'll be, be honest. I'll be totally honest. I wouldn't say that I'm a fan. I would say that I am familiar with some of their music. I had two cousins growing up who were huge Led Zeppelin fans. So whenever I would hang out with them, we would listen to Led Zeppelin and their, their bedrooms had Led Zeppelin posters all over them. And so they were thrilled when I told them I was, I was doing this. <laughs> so they're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You were mentioning the audition process and submitting that, that first chapter as the audition piece. And so Chris is sending all of these audition samples to me. And there were like 15 to 20 of them, I think. I was sitting in bed listening to one after the other. And, you know, it, it amazed me how different all the voices were, you know, how everybody's approach to it was so different. And Chris and I both kept coming back to yours because of what I just said earlier, there, there's something magnetic about your voice. And we just kept coming back to it. And we both said, I think this is the one. So uh -oh. <laughs> at one point I was considering doing the audiobook myself. And now I'm just so glad I didn't do that because I don't have your chops. That it never would have turned out the way it has. It was an interesting process that was totally new to me. I mean, this is my first book. I'd never done anything like this before. Right. I can only imagine. And, you know, I don't usually get to hear other people's auditions, but occasionally you do. And it's just interesting to hear other voice artists interpretation of the same material. And, and I just, I think it's very cool, but I would imagine being in your position, it also could be very overwhelming too, trying to figure out like which, which voice matches what you're hearing in your head yeah. as, as the story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you get the gig. How do you prepare to do an audio book? I mean, do you, do you go ahead and read the whole thing or are you just dealing with it in, in fits and starts and pieces? I tend to do it in pieces mm -hmm. to keep it fresh. I almost like not knowing what's going to happen as, as I go along. Now, obviously I read whatever I'm preparing to go into the studio. I will usually read two chapters at a time and I make all my notes and I tell my students all the time, like, you have to create a system that works for you because there's not just one system. I said, if you were to look at my script, I look like a serial killer or something <laughs> just because of all like, you know, notations and shorthand that I just write for myself. And a lot of times it's like reminding me of who this character is, this person I'm using a higher, higher part of my voice or a lower register, or just to remind me because sometimes you introduce a character earlier on in a book and then you don't hear from them for two or three chapters or several chapters later. And you have to keep notes for yourself as to who they are. And so I tend to go chapter by chapter. I really try to understand who these characters are. And that's what I love the, the acting part of it. Cause that's what I do. And that's what my background is in. So 
I love digging deep into who these people are. And, and your book was so easy to read and the characters were so interesting and, and just so intriguing. And I knew from the beginning that this was going to be an awesome, awesome Aww, experience. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Was there one of the characters that you connected, you felt that you connected with more than the others for whatever reason? Hmm. That's a great question. I really obviously loved the the two lead women, Luna and Claudia, for different reasons. With Luna, I think I connected with her curiosity for wanting to know, you know, who, not that this has been my personal experience, but I have friends who have wanted to know, like, who their birth father is yeah. or their birth father. And, and there's always that burning desire, even if you're very happy in every other aspect of your life and you're fulfilled and, and you have a good relationship with that other parent, there's still that curiosity of, well, who, who is he or who is she? And, and just, and wanting to know one way or the other, whether it's going to hurt or not, just that quest. And yeah. I really loved her passion and I loved her resilience and she was so brave like she was so young to go on this excursion like I would have never been that strong to do that at that age and so I me neither I didn't do that (laughs) either yeah I I I I know there are people I I have friends who would have been able to do that but I wouldn't have been able to do that at that age and so I just was I was captivated by her her strength and her curiosity, mm. determination. And Claudia, she's so unlike me, but I just love this very like ethereal, almost fairy like, just this presence, just taking life as it is, living in the moment, not overwhelmed by the day to day stresses of life, just, just. Easy peasy. And I and I wish that I could be more like that sometimes. And I just loved that about her. Minus the crazy part. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. But I think we all have our own kind of crazy. Yes. It's just a matter of how much we control it yeah. or don't control it. Well, this is fascinating for me to hear your take on it and see how you approached it really as an actor, not just somebody reading words on a page. You really had to get into the characters and think about motivation and get into their skin. So this is fascinating for me to hear that. Yeah. And I suppose every voice actor has a different process and and some are more just straight narration. And and I've had books like that and projects like that. And that's that's great. I, I enjoy that as well. But I, I prefer when there are characters and we're really bringing a story to life for the listener. That's my preference. That's more my passion. Was there a section, Melissa, that you had more fun doing than maybe some other sections or a section that you just thought, this is a little difficult, this one? What stood out? So I loved the character of Aunt Lorraine. She just was like such a piece of work to me. Like all of her scenes were just fun to do. I loved all the stuff in London. I liked those characters that we met along the way. And I I loved how they became so important and such an integral part of Luna's life as she went on. Like you didn't know that. You thought that, you know, she was just meeting this guy and whatever, whatever. And then he becomes like one of her closest, dearest friends who who, you know, plays a big role in her life as 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 well as some of the other people she meets in London. So I I enjoyed all those scenes just because of the challenge of playing different types of characters and playing around with different types of accents. And so that was challenging, but fun at the same time. Well, you just slipped seamlessly from a Southern accent to the British accent. You did that beautifully. Oh, thank you. Let's talk about the difficulties of dealing with us persnickety authors. Recording the dialogue of somebody else's characters, characters who are near and dear to that author's heart, whose voices that author hears clearly in her head, has got to be a challenge for you. Because sometimes your interpretation of a character's voice and the author's don't mesh, which is certainly not your fault. So in the first recording of Searching for Jimmy Page, that's kind of what happened. And it wasn't your fault, nor was it Chris's fault. There were some communication breakdowns, so to speak, early on, resulting in the need to re-record some of the dialogue. And that must have been a pain in the ass. 
but it turned out great. And I think that's testament to the quality of your work and the dedication of Talking Book to turn out stellar audiobooks. So thank you so much for bringing these characters who are as real to me as I am to life. Oh, that that makes me so happy because at the end of the day, my goal is always to just make the author happy. This is their baby. This is their project. And I feel like my job is is to bring your vision to life. And so that's really important to me. So when there's something that's not working for you, I, I want to know that so that we can make it better. We can make those changes. And Chris at Talking Books was really wonderful about that as well. And it, it felt very supportive. And it was it was great because, you know, you work on different projects and, and you want to get it right. And every book is different and every author is, is different, you know. So it's it's important to me and it's important to my audio engineer, Chris, that we bring your vision the way you want it to come out. It was a wonderful experience for me to see this take on this whole new life and to have you be a part of it. I hope people will have a listen because there was a lot that went into making that audio book. I appreciate your being on this journey with me. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be on the journey. It's been it's been a pleasure. It really has. And I'm excited that the book is coming out. And I have some friends and family who have been asking me, oh, when can I listen to it? Because, you know, they're a Jimmy Page fan. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we can just get Jimmy Page to listen to it and somebody to option it for a film, then yes. yeah. Yeah. Any takers out there? Right, right. Well, that would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and for being such a big part of the life of Searching for Jimmy Page. You can find the audiobook of the novel on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. Find out more about Melissa at her website, melissaconnell.com. You can also find her on Facebook at Melissa Connell and Instagram at mailcat92. We'll take another short break, then we'll be joined by Dave Lewis, the world expert on Led Zeppelin founder and editor of the Led Zeppelin fan magazine, Tight But Loose, and author of many books on the band. Back in a moment. This is Dave Lewis, and you're listening to Rock Is Lit. Welcome, 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 Dave, to Rock Is Lit. I am so thrilled to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. Well, Dave is simply the world expert on Led Zeppelin. There's just no other way to put it. He's written extensively <laughs> about the band, including the books Led Zeppelin, A Celebration, The Complete Guide to the Music of Led Zeppelin, Feather in the Wind, Led Zeppelin Over Europe, 1980, Evenings with Led Zeppelin, The Complete Concert Chronicle, and more. In 2015, Dave contributed the liner notes to the official Led Zeppelin release, the Complete BBC Sessions. He is also the editor of the Led Zeppelin fan magazine, Tight But Loose, which he started in 1978 when he was all of 22 years old. The magazine reaches Led Zeppelin fans all over 30 countries across the world and tracks recent events in the world of Led Zeppelin, including interviews and news, as well as updates on memorabilia and the latest bootleg news. So it is a tremendous honor to have you here, Dave. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Right from the start, you have been enormously supportive of my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, letting me slip in various announcements about the book several times in Tight But Loose. And I just want you to know I really, really appreciate that. That was a huge help. Well, I think the reaction to your book has been amazing. And um, Chris Gilesworth, for instance, who I obviously know very well, was very complimentary, and, and, and if he likes it, then you know you, you're in the right frame. But I think you've done very well, and great to see all the reaction that you've got. It was a very novel way of doing something about Led Zeppelin that hadn't been done. So congratulations to you. Well, thank you so much. And I want to talk about Tight But Loose, but first, let's go back a little bit. I'd like to hear a little bit about your background. So I know that you first heard Led Zeppelin when you were, what, 13 years old? How and when did your passion begin? I grew up in a house that was full of music from West Side Story to Mars Davis to the Beatles to the Rolling Stones. So, um, you know, I 
clued in on that and 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 it was my first passion even when I was um seven or eight years old um my first passion was was actually the Dave Clark Five and uh I actually went to see them it was the first gig I ever saw at the local cinema so I'd always had this incredible passion for music it went away for a little bit while I did other things and you know discovered football and and various other things (laughs) But it came right back. It came back in 1969 when I heard the Beatles Get Back single. And I thought, yeah, I need more of this. So (laughs) initially it was the Beatles, it was the Rolling Stones. Uh, I followed all the chart music, you know, the Hollies, whoever. I watched the music program we have here in England or did have Top of the Pops every Mm -hmm. week. And I listened to the chart rundown, which was done by Alan Freeman, a very popular DJ every Sunday and this is where my life (laughs) changed because as much as I loved all those bands um, and probably the Beatles and the Stones were my number ones this particular week in November 1969 Alan Freeman played an album track which he sometimes slipped in particularly he was quite a rock follower and I tuned in to find out if Fleetwood Mac's Albatross was going to take over the Archie's Sugar Sugar as number one. <laughs> that was the important thing for me. But in between that, I heard Led Zeppelin for the first time, and it was a whole lot of love. And this was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Uh, oh, wow. And, you know, the riffs were incredible. The vocalist was, was like some screaming banshee. The drummer felt like he was coming through my back door. And, <laughs> you know, the bassist uh, was the best bassist I'd ever heard outside of Paul McCartney. Uh, and, and so it went, this, com- this incredible chemistry which came over in this track struck me like a blockbuster. And yep. after that, nothing was quite the same because I wanted to know what this group was about. Yeah. Now, the thing is, they didn't release singles, so they weren't that accessible. So even though I wanted to know more, uh, it was a slow burn really until – we got in the house Led Zeppelin 2, which was in the early part of 1970. And, and from then on, I collected everything. I scoured the music press. I just wanted to know everything there was to know about this group. And it, it, it sort of went on from there, really, and, and it became a bit of a way of life. Um, obviously, Led Zeppelin 3 came out the next, uh, the next October. Uh, and then we go into 1971. And that's when I was lucky enough to see them perform live at the Empire Hall Wembley uh, on November the 21st, 1971. For 15-year-old, this was a whole new thing. That was only your second concert, it, wasn't it? Was. It was. I hadn't seen a live band uh, properly since the Dave Clark Five, uh, who, mm-hmm. incidentally, I still love. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, Led Zeppelin live at the Empire Hall, it was like um, you suddenly clued into this sort of counterculture, which had emerged... Um, I mean, one of the things, they were selling the Led Zeppelin Four album through Richard Branson's Virgin Records, which, again, Richard Branson was very much on the scene at that time and would soon launch the label. Um, it was a five-hour show. They had uh, a band called Home on first, then Stone the Crows with Maggie Bell. That circus acts in between. It, it, it was more than a gig, which was what Led Zeppelin was about. It wasn't, you know, as Peter Grant, their manager, told me, when I interviewed him, Led Zeppelin was an in-person band. And yeah. you had to see them live to get the full experience. And I was very lucky at that age to do that. Following that, the scrap got, the scrapbooks got more meticulous. The scouring of news, well, again, became a way of life. And again, in, you, you've got to remember in England, Led Zeppelin didn't appear on the telly. They, didn't, they were not often on the radio. They did have their BBC sessions in 69. And a, and a a BBC session in 71, which I taped on a reel-to-reel recorder. But, you know, information was hard to get. It, it was only through the Melody Maker and the Enemy, the music papers, which were hugely popular at the time. Mm-hmm. That was the media that we had. And Led Zeppelin didn't tour often, so that, that was always going to be a difficulty. And I was still quite young. I didn't have a lot of money. I, I, I'd only just started work and left school. So, again, all of that was bit by bit, you know, it was small sort of stepping stones to, to where it sort of erupted. But, yeah, up to then, I mean, up to, the, up to 71, 72, it was hard to get information, which is where this would lead to me inventing this magazine. But 
that was still a bit of a way off. There was a few things that happened before that. What happened before that? Okay. <laughs> well, I saw them again in uh, the December of 1972. They played the Alexander Palace. They did a lengthy tour of England, which I would have loved to have gone to see more. But again, I was still only 16. But I vowed that if Led Zeppelin played again, I would try and be there in the UK at any point, anywhere. And that was a mantra that I carried forward into uh, 1974 and 75. So when they announced they were going to play five dates at Earl's Court in London, there was no question I was going to be at all five. And I was at all five. (laughs) It was an incredible week. I mean, that was a coming of age. I was then 18. And I got to meet them because backstage they held a party. Oh, my gosh. The whole Earl's Court experience was was quite (laughs) quite magical for me because uh, I went with my girlfriend and, and She's the only lady that I know saw Led Zeppelin five times at Hell's Court because she was next to me. But we got the tickets. Like some of them I, I got on postal you know, applications. Others we queued up for, but I got all five. Anyway, on the last night, wow. which was the May the 25th, they had a party inside Hell's Court. They called it the Swan Song Restaurant. So we hung around, and unbelievably, uh, the security in those days wasn't was quite lapsed, really, and uh, all the goings-on behind the stage was under a big black curtain, and we managed to see through that curtain, and we could see that all the limousines and the dressing rooms, which are all mobile dressing rooms, Els Court was an exhibition centre, and after a while, we hid around a bit, and then we were able to just go through these, this black curtain, and sitting on a limousine right in front of me was Robert Plant. Oh, my gosh! It was just an incredible moment. And we spoke to him and he signed some staff. And and, I mean, I was shaking like a leaf, as you can imagine. I mean, he really did look like a rock dog. I bet. He didn't look like um, anyone I'd ever seen apart from on stage. (laughs) And suddenly I was in this new world, you know, and here we are in the midst of many stars because going into the, the restaurant where they were having this party, they all had to get in. So Jimmy Page went by us, John Bonham, John Paul Jones. There was Jeff Beck there, there was John Anderson from Yes. Wow. Was, and we saw them all go in. I mean, the good thing is we knew they had to come out. Now, we didn't have passes for the party, <laughs> but we hung around and weren't going anywhere. And, again, there was no security guys, you know, to move us off. There was a few of us there. There was about, I'd say about 15 of us. So we knew they had to come out. So the hours went by. And, again, I can tell an incredible story. It was about – two or three o'clock in the morning, and I went for a walk around the Earl's Court area, and I turned a corner, and I was right next to the stage. So it was very easy for me to walk onto the stage. So unbelievably, oh wow! the only thing that was left was John Paul Jones's piano, actually. And, uh, you know, I was actually standing next to it, looking out to all those seats that they'd played to just a few hours earlier. So that, that was just incredible. Anyway, oh, they all man. came out and we had more chats with them and they all signed stuff. You know, that was never an intention to meet them, but it had happened. And it was almost, there's many things in this long journey that I've had that were almost meant to be. Call it, you know, a bit of karma or whatever, but that really kicked it off. Yeah. So that's 1975. So we're getting to 76 when they're going to release Presence. And I work for a record shop. It's called WH Smith. It was the first of many record shops that I worked for. I was able to, you know, combine my hobby with my job, and it was a wonderful thing. And I got access to a lot of Led Zeppelin information and various things. Uh, and one of the things we got was that we used to have a music directory, and it had all the phone numbers of the record companies. So it had the phone number of Swan Song Records. So I thought I ought to ring them up really and just say. You know, any information <laughs> so i blindly rang and i just said uh, i just i just told it as it was i said i'm a huge fan you know there's not enough information coming through i wonder if you can tell me when the new album's going out and that was the first phone call now the woman that answered it was unity mclean who was their press officer and she took a bit of a shine to me so i continued to ring and and i was telling her about my scrapbooks and all of this and she said well look why don't you come into the office and we can have a chat. And we've got some pictures that I wouldn't mind seeing because we don't know where they're taken. And you may. This was late 76. I went into Kings Road, into the office, and I met Unity. And it, again, it was just 
it was an incredible thing. And I saw various musicians come in and out over the, I went to Swan Song quite a lot over the last, over the next four or five years. So that was a bond that I'd able to create with Unity. And then the next step of this journey is that in 1977, after Robert Plant had suffered um, an accident in Greece, which took him off the road for a good while, yeah. they were back and they were playing this mammoth US tour. Now, I did harbour a vague plan to try and get to one of the gigs. And Unity was trying to help me. We were trying to get to Madison Square Garden. But my meagre 22 pounds a week that I was earning was never going to get me there. <laughs> but I, I hatched uh-huh. another plan. Uh, I decided to go off to Heathrow Airport and watch them fly out. And Unity gave me all the times. It was May the 17th, 1977. And wow. I had the most unbelievable afternoon in their company. And I met Richard Cole there. And, uh, and they just, you know, we uh. just hung around. There was very few people there. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a throwback to the Beatles days when you'd have thousands of people watching them fly in from America or to America. But it was lovely. And again, I just felt a connection. You know, I felt I was in the middle of something special and I needed to keep pushing it and getting the most out of it I could. And that's exactly what I did. And it, it literally became a way of life. Now, it didn't stop me liking other music, but Led Zeppelin was the number one. My world was revolving around that. So you get to 1978, and that's when I came up with this idea to do a fan magazine. Uh, it was built really on the on the ethics of, well, actually punk rock, because punk rock had come along and and changed, shook the industry up, and we had the Sex Pistols. I know it wasn't such a big thing in the US, but we had the Sex Pistols and the Clash, all of which Jimmy and Robert really loved. They actually went to see the Damned. and uh, But punk ethics was that you could do it yourself. So they had what they called punk fanzines, and they were literally handwritten. One was called Sniffing Glue. There was another one called Ripped and Torn. And I thought, if they can do that, I can do that. Now, I had no writing experience formally. I'd, I'd always written and wanted to write, and I'd had lots of journalistic heroes that were writing for The Enemy and Melody Maker, Chris Charles, which would be one, Charles Charmari, Nick Kent, all these people that were very much in the Zeppelin world. So I thought, yeah, I can put pen to paper. And I did, I would, I'd already done a review of Earl's Court after the show. So I, there had been a writing passion. I didn't have a typewriter. I didn't have, I didn't have much money. So the first one I hand wrote, I got it locally photocopied. And I put a couple of adverts in the enemy. I told Unity at Swansong I was going to do this. And she said, sounds a good idea. Um, it, the first one was very crude and it was very, um, you know, doing itself. But the passion was there. And I put the advert in. I had 200 copies. And within six weeks, they'd gone. So I thought, oh, I'm onto something wow. here. So Peter Grant had, had heard that I was doing this. And they were very relaxed about it. I mean, they, for a band that was very controlling and, and very wanted to be in charge of their destiny, they, they let me in, really, which, again, was an incredible thing. Yes. And I pursued it. And then the magazine got bigger. I went to from an A4 to, uh, sorry, an A5 to an A4. It was glossy. And everything was going incredibly well. And and I was getting up to a circulation of about nine or a thousand by the end of or the middle of 1980, which then led me to my next experience was the fact they were going to play in Europe, a low key tour before they were going to go to the US. So they played 14 dates around Germany and Holland and Belgium and Zurich. Uh, so I thought, well, if they're going there, I better try and get there. So I somehow rather <laughs> managed to hustle uh, myself over there to watch five gigs. I saw the second night in Cologne, Mannheim two twice, Frankfurt and Munich. I didn't see the very last gig, but I saw the Munich. And all of those, I was at the side of the stage and they invited me on. Oh, my and gosh. And it was just the most incredible. They invited you? They invited me. The security guy. Oh, wow. Oh, Peter Grant, I was there. And uh, most of the hotels they booked in, I had great access to them. And, and I saw them a lot. And it was just, you know, oh, it's Dave from Type of Loose. You know, he's here, whatever. You know, they knew that. I think there was a big trust, I think, as well, between what I did 
yeah. and how I portrayed it. I, I wasn't at all interested in their personal lives. I wasn't interested in the sex and drugs and rock and roll, of which there probably was quite a large amount. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was for the music, and that's what I built my reputation on. So my integrity to portray their music in a way that nobody else was doing, I think was the thing that really gelled with them and allowed me to have that access. Yeah. It was short-lived because, obviously, very sadly, John Bonham died in the September. I struggled on. Uh, I knew, I guess we all knew it was over, and that was very sad. I had to deal with that. And the magazine, I kept going for a bit, but then it became a little bit harder dealing with three managers. Obviously, Robert was doing his uh, solo thing. Jimmy was with the firm. So I never stopped writing or anything, but I did have a gap where I didn't produce the magazine. And this really then led to the book. So that's the next thing is that I thought, well, look, the magazine's probably, at least for the moment, it's probably done. But I need to write a book about all these experiences that I've had and to chronicle the music, which I didn't think was being chronicled that well. I mean, the one thing to remember is that in the early 80s, Led Zeppelin's stock was very low. You had a situation where they hadn't been able to tour. Obviously, they were now split up. The other significant thing is that the week they announced they were splitting, which is December 4, 1980, uh, five days later, John Lennon got shot. And so all of that news was the biggest news, of course. And, and the Zep news got sort of put under the carpet a bit. It wasn't yeah. that hadn't have happened, and I wish it hadn't have happened. We all do, I'm sure. Um, the Zep thing, I think, would have had a better closure. It didn't really have a closure. Um, certainly in the early 80s, their stock was low. And when you think of bands like Van Halen were coming through and taking their crown, really, in Rush and people like that. And, you know, in England, we had the new wave of British heavy metal with Def Leppard, Iron Maiden, not bands that I associated with personally. But so it took a while, really, for their reputation to get back on track. And I would say, really, the Live Aid appearance was quite a turning point because I think regardless of what the performance was, and we all know it wasn't brilliant, but the spirit was there. Yeah. I stand by that live aid appearance because, all right, there were lots of things going wrong. Robert's vocals were hoarse. We had Phil Collins had come over on Concord, didn't really know the tracks, whatever. Jimmy was, you know, being Jimmy as, as he only could be. Um, <laughs> and, but I love it because it's, it's so chaotic. It's so Led Zeppelin. And that changed, that changed things a bit because then you've got MTV and, um, you know, I did a documentary for MTV when I, I was on camera and suddenly people were more interested in Zeppelin. And another turning point at that point was when The Hammer of the Gods came out, the Stephen Davis book, which... The same year. ...was a very well-received book, <laughs> probably not by them because obviously it, it told no. the story as it was in terms of the sex and drugs and rock and roll, which, you know, no hiding it, you know, they could be very mischievous people, <laughs> and they were. Mm -hmm. The music, I think, got lost in that book. So my next plan was to produce a, a book that chronicled their music in a way that hadn't been done. So I'd done one, I did a small print book called The Final Acclaim, which came out in 1983. Uh, the most inappropriate book title of all time because it wasn't the final acclaim. <laughs> there, there would be many more. There would be many <laughs> more acclaims by me. Um, and it really was the best of TBL. It was all right and it did okay, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, so I put this idea to Chris Charles was actually at Omnibus Press that there should be a, a reference book about Led Zeppelin's music. And I, I pitched an idea. He took a good while to say yes. Um, but he did mm. in 1989, and through 1990, I wrote the book. I mean, coincidentally, and another turning point was the fact that they had, for the first time, um, you know, a Greatest Hits album, which was the remasters, which Jimmy had worked on in the May of 1990. That was very timely because, again, that really raised their stock because, you know, in the CD world, there was now a CD compilation of Led Zeppelin's best work. All that was great right. for me and that book the zeppelin of celebration as i called it did very well and was very well received by them as well i know i know they all got copies so that that's where we were in 1990 the next thing was um 
obviously I was now in touch with quite a lot of fans and I, as I'd always always had been. The whole thing about Type of Loose was I always called it, you know, platform of communication. It was like I wanted my big thing is sharing music. I love I still do this every day. I share music. And yeah. principally I share music of Led Zeppelin and I certainly did in that early nineties. So there was a fellow fan, Andy Adams, who sadly passed away a couple of mm-hmm. years ago, who was yeah. right on the butt and an incredibly knowledgeable person. I thought I knew a bit about Led Zeppelin, but Andy Adams was just amazing. So we put our heads together and decided that we would stage the first ever Led Zeppelin UK convention in the May of 92. There'd been a couple in America. Uh, there was one in 1988 run by a big collector that I know, Brian Knapp. So we knew it would be a tall order, but we booked the whole weekend at vast expense in a, in a major hotel in London. But it went fantastically well. And very luckily, we had the Bonham family involved. Deborah Bonham, John Bonham's sister, oh, played yeah. at the at the convention on the Sunday and all the Bonham family were there. There was Mick, John's brother, there was his mum. Again, it was karma. It was a very special weekend and we still talk about it in 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 those terms because it was a it was almost like a getting together again for the Bonham family to celebrate his life and we were able to do that. So that was a wonderful thrill yeah. and it, it went incredibly well. Um we weren't very good businessmen I have to say but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> we had a great time, more or less. Um, and that sort of continued. And that was the point I brought the magazine back. I, I decided that it was time to, you know, for the type of list to reappear. So issue seven came out, and then I just ran with it all the way. Uh, and, and it's been an incredible thrill and privilege to be able to do it. It's worth mentioning that the type of loose story in terms of the magazine is at an end because I have decided after 45 issues, that it's probably the appropriate time for me to call a halt. Not that I'm retiring, but mm. I, the magazine was always very intensive to do, and it was a one-man show that I did out of here. And, you know, life's changed a bit over the years, and we've had the pandemic, and we're all getting older, and health issues come into play, and and I had to work out what I could and couldn't do. And, uh, I, yeah, the magazine, at least for the moment, never say never but it's had a great run right i'm still very active i still do my facebook site every day i do my tv on website which will carry on and i do the updates every every week and share this amazing you know knowledge and experience that i've had and it's wonderful to hear so many other people a lot younger that have caught on and the zep thing just is forever in the present tense it's never passed i've been incredibly lucky and blessed to be in the middle of that. Um, in fact, the one thing I am doing, I am going to, well, I've started to write my memoirs because, as you can hear, I've got a lot of stories. You've got some stories to I, tell. I want to get it all down. It's probably going to take me a long time. I've actually done, I've done 20,000 words and I'm in 1971, so I've got a long way oh to go. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and all the genesis of, you know, when you look back on your life and I'm you know, 66, I'm not getting any younger. Um, you know, I'm a young thinking 66, I think. But you look back and it's great to, a bit like I've just done now, to, to tell people where, how did this happen? How did I manage to cultivate this? And there's been lots of ups and downs. You know, there's many stories that I could tell at times when it was difficult. You know, I got through it and I, we always got an end result. And then again, talking about the Dave Clark Five and when I was seven, music was always music and collecting. I've always collected things, you know, and I mean, I collect records fanatically. And always will. I love a tangible thing. I'm no good at streaming. I'm no good. That's not my thing. I like our LP sleeves. I like CDs. I like, yeah. You know, and yeah, that is my world. And I'm in touch with many people. As I said, the mag reached 30 countries. I, you know, I've got 5,000 people on Facebook that follow my stuff. And it's wonderful. It's just a great, great wow. thing. And again, the middle of it has been this band that associate with so many people on so many levels. And I'm not the only one that's had the live experiences of many people that saw them in the 70s. Nowadays, you know, it's very easy. You can put on YouTube and watch Led Zeppelin and Court or wherever. Mm-hmm. Now, that didn't happen in our day. 
I've just one of the things I've just produced is a second version of my Led Zeppelin at Earl's Corbett, which is called Five Glorious Nights. And it's um it's a log of the shows pictorially uh, and it looks great and I did it all in sort of set list order and it's just come out in a new version. But one of the points I make in that is when I went to Earl's Court, as did eighty five thousand people over the five nights, I would say ninety nine percent had never seen moving pictures of Led Zeppelin. Because there were none. There was hardly anything. The only thing was a clip that was shown on a, a film called Super Show, where Zepp did a version of Days of Confused. But when Led Zeppelin had a screen above you know, the stage at Earl's Core, it was the first time people had seen moving pictures of Led Zeppelin. Photographs, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a different era. The song remains the same, had not come out yet. That was 76. And the other thing is, I think that helped the mystique of Led, you know, Led Zeppelin. It was always like a big secret society, a very big secret society, but you felt connected because you knew about Led Zeppelin. You know, you know, in our, when I was at school, it was, and I like all these bands, T-Rex, Slade, you know, whatever, all the glam rock, David Bowie, all of those bands I love. But Zeppelin was a mystique, you know, people... You've only got to look at the album cover. Exactly. What on earth is all that about? You know, why is Led Zeppelin? Why is this man got a lot of sticks on his back? Why are these children climbing up a you know, <laughs> mountain? You know, all brilliantly orchestrated by Peter Grant, the manager, and and Jimmy, who was so artistic in what mm-hmm. he did, and the chemistry of the four of them musically. You know, there is there's been nothing like it. There just hasn't. You know, uh, there are a handful of acts. I mean, obviously. We know the Beatles are probably the most influential band, and, and certainly are. But there's the Beatles, there's the yeah. Stones, and there's there's Zet, and there's one or two others. You know, they they just they'll be around for the next hundred years, long absolutely long before you know I'm you know I'm gone. But but I'm leaving a bit of a legacy, and I've, I've been a, a lucky man to do that. I feel very privileged. Um, I'm still in touch with their offices. You know, I I I every now and again I'm called upon. I've been very lucky to be involved. You know, officially and stuff. I, I did the sleeve notes for the BBC sessions. I worked with Jimmy on that. I worked with Robert on his Nine Lives box set. I've interviewed John Paul Jones a fair few times. I've had I've had a great relationship with them. I think because they trust me, and they trust me not to get it wrong. Yeah. And there's been some ups and downs in that. Um, it'll all be in the memoirs, but by and large, I've been a lucky man. Dave, can you give us a little teaser of some of the stories you're going to tell in your memoir? Yeah, well, I, well, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen Robert Plant in a tent. I've seen him in Istanbul. I've watched him play five-a-side football. Um, I've been next to him watching him play five-a-side football. I've been his, in the back of his car, um, taking me through to Wembley when he played football, and I had muddy footprints, and I put muddy footprints all over his back seat. <laughs> uh, he did forgive me. Um, I've had... When I did the BBC sessions, I had a meeting with Jimmy in a fish and chip shop in Ladbroke Grove. Mm. So I've had fish and chips with Jimmy. John Paul Jones, he played a gig with Julie Felix at Borders Bookshop. This was in, uh, I think, 1998. And I did an interview with Julie Felix. It was in the stockroom out the back of Borders Bookshop. Nice. John was warming up his mandolin, and it was just me and him there. Ugh. And he gave him a medley of going to California, that's the way, and Gallows Pole, just me and him. Oh, him wow. playing the mandolin, and me shivers up my spine. So I've had a lot of experiences. I've had some crazy, crazy experiences. And I've met Prince Charles when I went to, uh, who's now King Charles, of course, when I went to see Robert play at the Prince's Trust gig, and I was, I was backstage with Robert and his wife, his then wife Maureen and I've, I had a bear hug from John Bonham in a Munich hotel <laughs> where he wrote he wrote down his phone number he said ring me when you get back mm. of which I did I rang him twice at Cut or Green and I, I would have gone on that US tour um uh, I've had yeah I've had several phone calls of Robert Plant I had a meeting with them all about the coda sleeve that was in March uh 1982 yeah Robert Plant phoned me up uh, I don't know, six o'clock. Oh, Robert Plant's on the phone. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, and he was. And uh, he said, Can you come in in the next couple of days and bring a load of pictures? We want to wade through a load of your stuff. And some of my pictures ended up in the sleeve, the open out sleeve, oh, which has got a collage of pictures. 
I've had in some incredible experiences. Yes, you have. And I've been a blessed man. So more of that will be in the book. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I was very, very lucky to be on Robert Plant's guest list at the O2. Oh, I was going to ask I you sat, about that. You were there, huh? I sat with his family. Mm. I sat with Kevin Gammon, who, who was a lifelong friend. Uh, it was a night of nights, as mm-hmm. we know. I enjoyed the film immensely, of which I went to the press conference for that. And yeah, I'd, I've just been a lucky man. I've been a blessed man. But I've worked very hard to make sure I represented Led Zeppelin in the best way. Yes. And I shared this music so people could enjoy it as much as I do. And that continues every day. Davis, one of the reasons that you started Tight But Loose, a reaction to the press that they were getting, because... During those early years, during the the bulk of their career, they didn't get great press on either side of the Atlantic. It really wasn't until later that they became kind of deified. No, they didn't. That's a very good point. I was incredibly protective of them and their reaction. I mean, we know the Rolling Stone magazine didn't like the first two two albums. Mm -hmm. And anyone that criticized them, I, I was hurt personally. Well, in my scrapbook, I would never put the negative reviews. Yeah. They'd go in a little corner somewhere because some of the, the criticism was wrong and it was, it was poor. You know, it wasn't based on, you know, facts. Some people didn't get them. In the end, you know, the press got very good. I'd say post 75, certainly at Earl's Court, you know, that was very favorable. And, they certainly into Nebworth, you know, the reaction to the Nebworth thing, which they had a lot to lose playing those two gigs in the climate of punk and new wave here. And they had a lot to lose at the O2. So I wanted to tell it like it was. And I didn't, there was lots of errors that were always creeping through. Something like, you know, Physical Graffiti, the double album. Uh, only seven of those tracks, no, eight actually, were, were actually new recordings. The, the rest were stuff that had been recorded before that they wanted to use and that wasn't really known so one of the first things I did in one of the early mags was you know track all that there was another thing I did one of the first things I had in print we had another music paper called Sounds which was a really good newspaper and they came to me in 78 the same year that I started the magazine and said they were going to run a three-week special would I bring in a load of memorabilia so they could reproduce it and I did, and, and that was the first thing I was really um, in print by. And it, you know, I had a byline, you know, it was a set fan, Dave Lewis, as I seem to remember it was called. And I did a complete run of bootlegs. And I used to see people going to record fairs and opening up that middle section that I did about the bootlegs and sort of ticking them off. So, again, I knew <laughs> I knew this information needed to be out there. Yeah. And, it, and I always tried for it to be as accurate as possible. I'm not the only one that chron- you know, has chronicled them. I mean, obviously, Louis Ray has done his tape documentary books, which are brilliant. And, you know, there's been other people um, that have come in my wake. It's a shared thing, but I've certainly hung in there. My passion is as great as it was that afternoon when I heard, you know, a whole lot of love. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, never, it never wanes. And the influence they've had, and in a way, the influence that I'm able to have, it is a very special thing. You know, I, I think people look to me, you know, and it's a very precious thing. I don't treat it lightly. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I try and answer everyone who asks something. I always have done, you know, everything I can share, I will. I have a number of platforms, as I say, that I can do that. And it's just great fun. It, you know, that's the other thing. I've met so many wonderful people who have become lifelong friends and, and still are. And that's another thing this thing does. You know, it brings people together. Music does that. And many generations of people. And sure. Again, you do now get the situation where people are taking their younger kids to see Robert Plant. You know, the dads are taking the sons or daughters. And, you know, that's a fabulous thing. It, it just goes on and it, it never fades away. Yeah. And again, when I look at what you did with your book, mm-hmm. you know, there's different angles that can take the story. There's a lot of sort of mythology with Led Zeppelin, which which people clue into. It's a big, big story with a lot of twists and turns. And that's the fascination. I think the fascination for younger people is probably twofold. It's certainly, you know, the music and what it is. But I think the influence of people who want to play music and be musicians and play like Jimmy Page, play in the style of John Barnum, John Paul Jones and sing like Robert Plant, 
that's going to go on and goes on all the time. People who learn, you know, young kids. I bet there's somebody today, as a 15 year old today, has picked up a guitar and probably played Stairway to Heaven for the first time. And and when you think about all the tribute bands that tread the boards every every week, uh, every night in America and England, we're going to see one on Saturday. Uh, and you know, it's a great night out. People are hearing the best rock catalog ever minted. Um, you know, long may it rain. You know, so. Uh, I think that's great. I think there's so many different facets that people can clue into. That you know, there's the bootlegs that just goes on and on. There's the film finds that you know, people are coming up with cine films, you know, and it's, there's a Facebook group, the Dogs of Doom, which these guys are only in their twenties, but they're so diligent about what they do with the film, and it's just great. It really is. It's great. Well, thank goodness for people like you. And, and Jimmy Page has also been a big keeper of the flame. He's kept this thing going. Yeah, I've been, yeah I've, again, there's been ups and downs, but, you know, never enough for me to say that's it. You know, I, there's always another day and there's always something else to do. There's another angle. There just always is. And, and also that this great looking back, I mean, part of my TV on website is that we look back. You know, when I look back 50 years to the first time I saw them or more, um, yeah, it's incredible to think it's 50 years ago, you know, the House of the Holy came. And I brought it on the day, obviously, and, and all of that. And it's, they still sound, those albums still sound as fresh as the day they were you know, recorded. And I think yep. that's a credit to Jimmy as a producer. He doesn't get enough credit, I don't think, for that. Yeah, he's a unique, unique guitarist and musician, but his, his production mm-hmm. values made the sound of Led Zeppelin. They just, it just did. And he knew how he wanted them to sound. And I've been in his company when he's emphatically explained that. And, and it's been a thrill to hear it from the horse's mouth. He, he knows what he's achieved. He knows. Oh, yeah. And, and, okay, he hasn't played for a long time. He doesn't owe anyone anything. He doesn't owe me or you or anyone. He's done it. And he's, a, he's had a great life. He's got you know, a lovely lady. And, and he, he does what he wants to do. Robert is different. He carries on. John Paul Jones, again, is a musician, but uh, they've all come out of it so well. You know, I think it's a great, the O2 was a great closure. You know, yes, it would have been great if they'd have done some more dates, but, you know, we all know it's done. You know, that was a sure. wonderful ending, and let's leave that as an ending. I'm with you. I'm, I'm glad that was the end of it because they went out on such a high note with that yeah, show. Yeah, you know, they're, they're now very elder statesmen, you know, and, and, it's difficult to keep that going. Robert doesn't sing like he used to. He's cleverly adapted his, you know, style. He can still sing brilliantly. I went to see him in November in in Ireland. They play, he played a tent in Ireland in Wexford. I was right in front row. It was just, again, I was getting as much of a vibe then as I did in Empire Paul Wembley in 1971. So <laughs> uh, all I know is I'm not quite sure whether Albatross took over the arches. But I know I heard Led Zeppelin that afternoon and I didn't forget mm. it. And it's had a <laughs> lasting effect, <laughs> a very long lasting effect. Yeah. And I, I love your passion and people who love Led Zeppelin get it. When I first saw them on the screen, the TV screen in 1985, when I was 15 years old, I had a visceral reaction and I just became a passionate fan from then to now. And it, it's that band resonated with me in a way that no other band did. They just took hold of my soul. Right. I get that. I get that totally. And I think part of it has to do a bit with the mystique, but ultimately it's the music. The music is what keeps them going. And they were brilliant, are brilliant musicians. You've mentioned interacting with each one of the four members at one time or another. If you had to come up with one word or a couple of words, you can cheat, to describe each one of them, what would it be? What's one word to describe Robert? I would say Robert Majestic. Mm, that's good. Okay. John Bonham. John Bonham Powerhouse. I like that too. John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones, the expert. Oh, gosh, yes. And you know I got to end with Jimmy. Jimmy Page. <laughs> Jimmy, a man of wisdom. All right. Who gets it right. How close do you think 
the mystique surrounding him. And he certainly cultivated that himself as well. How close do you think that is to the real person? Well, that's a good question. I, I would say, <laughs> I think Jimmy's very aware of that. And I think mm-hmm. he's very clever with it. And uh, nobody really knows the real Jimmy Page but him. And yeah, I would imagine he does enjoy the mystique that surrounds it. But you have to have the credentials to to um, have that mystique built around you. So you have to have something intrinsic. And as a genius musician, a genius producer, the coolest rock star that ever walked on a stage, it just is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just a one-off thing, isn't it? You know, it's not, it's not going to happen again. It's just not. None, none yeah. of, you know, unfortunately, with, as we know, in recent times and continues, you know, these people have fallen off the cliff. Jeff Beck was so sad. David Crosby, there'll be more. And there's no one to replace them. I, you know, I, I, there's just not, you know. And maybe that's just the way it is. Maybe, you know, I know there's some great music out there now. I'm not trying to be um, someone who doesn't understand that new music comes through and, it, 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 you know, there's rap and hip-hop or whatever. And lots of people get off on that just like we do with Led Zeppelin. And that's fantastic. And, you know, Ed Sheeran, Coldplay, whoever. But I don't see the mystique and the, you know, they're just one. The Beatles was a one-off. The Stones yes. continues to be a one-off. Bruce Springsteen probably. You know, Elvis, you know, the obvious iconic you know, people. And, and Zeph is right in there. Be, but it was the one thing about it, and I'd also mention, hang on, my phone's going. Sure. <laughs> it happens. Sorry, folks. Sorry, I'm That's... back. Um, <laughs> and, we, I mean, and we haven't mentioned The Who, which is another great chemistry. Uh, you know, yeah. I think the chemistry of the four people that were in Led Zeppelin was so right. I, I, there's, there's no parallel, with really. it. I mean, The Who replaced Keith Moon, and mm-hmm. they carried on. And you know, quite admirably, but Zep couldn't. They couldn't do it. They just it wouldn't have been right. It, it yeah. was about the four of them, and you know, I'm glad they didn't. Um, Me too. It worked beautifully with Jason, and they played with other great drummers when they did the Page and Plant thing. Michael Lee was a brilliant drummer. Yeah, and and that Page and Plant thing was a very great second win for a lot of people. You know, we were able to see them again in that space of time, um, and lots of people who weren't old enough. Had a great time with Page and Plant, and you know they were great gigs. And you know they reinvented the Zep thing quite well. Would have been nice if John Paul Jones would have been involved, but at that point, you know, it, it just wasn't. So the chemistry, yeah. I, again, when we're talking about Jimmy, yes, I'm sure he loves that image. Who wouldn't, you know? Um, <laughs> but the one thing he doesn't do, he doesn't abuse it. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not effect. Uh, Jimmy is one of the most genuine people I've ever met, and he just. You know, he believes in what he does so emphatically. He makes the right, you know, the right calls. And he made the right calls during the Zeppelin era. And again, with Peter Grant, who was integral in what they did, and Richard Cole, who had a great relationship and sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. It, it took, the Zepp thing it was about a team of people. It was like a team. And that, that team looked out for each other and knew what the goal was. And and nobody moved the goalposts. It was that's what we're going to do. Nobody's done it before. We're going to do it. We're going to play Nebworth. Well, we'll play it twice. We're going to play our score. We'll do five. Madison Square. We'll do six. You know, yep. it was just like that. It just was the way it worked, and it worked beautifully. And uh, every, we've all got a lot to thank them for. And you know, they don't owe anybody anything. No. Um, they've done it. Yeah, and you you know, everyone can love the music and listen to the music and the bootlegs and the live concerts mm-hmm. and the YouTube clips. And, you know, in my, you know, when I started this magazine a long time ago, there was none of that. But that was one of the reasons I wanted to spread this word. And, uh, you know, I'm a lucky man to have been able to do it as well as I have. Yes. And for as long as I have. And it goes on in different formats and it will go on. I mean, my wife, Janet, as well, who I ought to mention, has lived with all of this for 40 years. <laughs> Kudos to Janet. Uh, she's understood <laughs> it, and, and she loves it, but obviously she had to let me get on with it. Well, you know, right, we, right. And uh, I, I've been a lucky man that she's understood that I had to get on with it. And if I'm going to Istanbul next week, then I'm going to Istanbul. I have had to <laughs> slow down. I am trying to slow down. Nobody knew all those years ago 
that it was going to last like this and it was going to have such an effect and enhance so many lives in such a brilliant way. And, you know, that's, mm-hmm. I feel incredibly proud to have been part of that and, and continue to. And, and it's been a privilege for me, absolute privilege. And, uh, you know, I don't take it lightly. I, I just, I enjoy, I cherish it as much as I can. You know, and I will do as long as I can. Well, that's fantastic. I do just want to say, Jimmy seems to be in such a wonderful place right now in his life. He has this, what, of course, I don't know him personally, but he seems to have this wonderful partnership with the poet Scarlett Sabat. And I really enjoy their it does. Yeah, it does. their collaboration catalyst, that album they put out where they worked together and Jimmy did the music and it was spoken word. And so he seems to be in a great place. And um, the, I, I went to see I went to see her do her piece. It was at a bookshop. Jimmy was there. Okay. And she was brilliant. She really yeah. was. It, it just fits. Yes, yeah. you know it's artistic. Jimmy's an artistic person, hence why he got involved in the book publishing with the you know you know the anthology book. He likes real objects of art, be it music, yeah. poetry, visual, um, and that doesn't stop. And yeah, I just love that he's so happy. You know, yeah. I've had a good association with him. I mean, he was he he often he doesn't do it so much now, but he used to come to the record fairs that we had and you know people just left him alone to you know he's a massive record buyer and i've had lots of conversations with him about records that he's purchased and you know he would ask what i've got and yeah it's, yeah he's a collector he's a collector as well that's a, that's a definite um he's definitely got that um let's face it he's incredibly proud of what he did as sure. well it is as john paul jones is as they should be you know there's no shy. you know people have often criticized robert for being sort of you know, offhand about, you know, the legacy, but he's not. And if you read it properly and read what he's saying, you know, there may have been a time when he was trying to escape it in the early 80s, but, you know, for those 12 years, that you know, that's going to define his life forevermore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just is. And same with John Paul Jones. Yes, they've done loads of other great stuff, but it's the Zepp thing. He's going to get asked about Led Zeppelin every day. I mean, Jason, I'm sure, gets asked about the O2 every single time he goes out. And again, how great that that he is continuing the legacy, yes. With his John Bonham experience, um, or evening as it's called now, I see it's going to Australia. It's it's never come to England. I, I, I hope it does. Huh. Okay. Because I know people in the states who've gone out oh, a great night, you know, and, and the singer's really great. So he's another one that's you know found his niche and. And I'm hoping to see Bonham Bullock. At some point, you know, Deborah Barnum. Oh, out fantastic. Album. I mean, again, I've had so many times, great times with Deb, some mo- amazing moments. And with Pat, uh, John's um, mm-hmm. wife. The Bonhams, whenever you see them, I went to the launch of the of the, the statue, the memorial in Redditch, yeah. and it was an incredible emotional day. It really was. Robert went during the night. There's a great picture, isn't there, of him standing as they were, as they were putting it in in the middle of the night. And then I went early in the morning, 10 o'clock, and Deb was there and Pete and uh, quite a few other people who read it at New John. And it was such a lovely thing. And again, you know, he's got he's had recognition. John Bonham has had the right recognition that he should always have had in that town. And people right. know, you know, when someone says Redditch, they know that there's a John Bonham statue in the middle of the, literally in the middle of the town. And they have the celebration thing every year. So it's on again. It's in May, I think, this year. And, and that's a great thing. You know, there's, there's right. a lady called Ross Sidaway who does so much. She was part of the raising of the money for the fund to have it built. Um, so John's got his recognition. Great. You know, he can't be here, obviously, to share it. But it's there. And, you know, and certainly the Bonhams carry on doing what they did and what John did in being such a great musician. So... I met Deborah Bonham very, very briefly in 2006. I was I was on my own traveling in the UK and stopped to pay my respects at John Bonham's grave. And she, nobody else was there, and she just showed up. And I think Pete was with her, and we had this amazing exchange where my my brother is quite a bit older than I, and John was quite a bit older than she. And my brother was a drummer, too, in various rock bands. And I remember vividly, we just stood in front of her brother's grave, not talking about John Bonham, the rock star, but talking about her big brother and my big brother. And she could not have been sweeter to me. And she gave me a hug before I I left. Wow. 
but she was just made such an incredible impression on me, such a sweet person. Some things are meant to be, and that that was meant to be for you, without a doubt. Yeah, you know that's how things work. So, well, I'm glad you've had you've had your great experiences. Doesn't matter what, how, or when you picked up on Zeppelin or whatever, it it affects you, and when it affects you, it makes your life a whole lot better. And that's I've I've certainly found that in many many people. Here, here, and uh, it's yeah, it's a great it's a great thing. And you you've done a great thing. You've made your mark. Have you got plans to do other books? I'm working on it slowly but surely. I'm working on it. Keep me up to date. I will. Yeah, obviously, any support you need, you know who I am. We'll keep in touch. Yes. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Same here. And keep doing what you're doing because it's, it's great stuff. And you too. Find out more about Dave Lewis and Type But Loose at the Type But Loose website, typebutloose.co.uk. You can also find Dave on Facebook at Dave Lewis. If you're interested in learning more about my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, check out my website at christyalexanderhallberg.com. You can pick up a copy of the paperback wherever you buy books, your local indie bookstore, Amazon, and you can find the audiobook on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes of Rock is Lit to hear from more great rock novelists and special guests who will offer commentary on the music or musical events featured in these novels. If you like what you hear, subscribe, follow, and spread the word. Until next time, keep rocking and reading and getting lit. Rock is lit. Rock is lit.